The time is dusk. It's drizzling outside of the window, and there's rolling thunder in the distance from far away. The hotel looks fantastic for how short of a time it took to bring it to a serviceable standard for the marooned passengers of Her Royal Rose, stuck within the confines of the saturation which looms over the ocean just offshore. One breath of that air in the distance is enough to fill one's lungs with salt. And so, for the foreseeable future, for the months to come until it subsides, this is everyone's home now. A hastily reconstructed hotel that had ended its services ten years ago when Port Hillcrest's time serviced travelers, vacationers, fortune seekers, those who came to the rocky mountainous shores of Crow Perch. Trevor located in the sixth floor suite along with Dr. Glass is in his room. Dr. Glass in the living area looking out of the window a recent interaction between the two jarring to say the least has left them both confined for the moment. Nihilus von Stonen and Esperanza pace the hotel learning about its features, gathering information, and seeking details about that mysterious fifth floor, the one that even today, the majority of workers there refuse to enter, steeped in a history that keeps it, even in this moment, completely vacant. Last we left off, there was a scream in the floor below loud enough to be heard in the suite above. Trevor, who was looking in the mirror, wrapped his knuckles with bandages, gathering his willpower to venture below and find out what that was. Esper and Nihilus, while well, they saw that the hotel's proprietor, that is, Margaret Maggie Crane, was searching for her lost workers who were sent to the fifth floor for a clean out against the advice of the rest of the crew of the Whaler Hotel. They followed her to the elevator. She took her way up. And that's where we left off the last session. Trevor, with your knuckles wrapped, you made your way out of the room greeting Dr. Glass, and together, you decided to venture to the fifth floor below. Could somebody remind me, when we left off, did we rejoin Nihilus and Esper to the group? You were just about to. Trevor and Dr. Glass, as you walk to the door of your top floor suite and open it, you find Nihilus and Esperanza hastily walking in your direction through the halls. Trevor's kind of got a uh, an, an urgentness, sorry, an urgency to his walk. As soon as they come uh, in eye contact with him, he's just looking. Y'all heard that too, right? Certainly did. <sighs> he looks towards Esper. They, she, the the woman. Um, I think her name, Margaret. No, none of her employees wanted to go, so she went herself. And and then, then the scream. There is something terribly amiss going on on the fifth floor. I think we should make haste. She herself ventured on alone. We must intervene. We simply must. I can do this on my own. And he looks towards the rest of the party. Esper seems to be looking back and forth between everybody else in the hallway quite a bit. And, um... There is a bit of a tremor to her shoulders as she's kind of standing overly still. She's very stiff, except for that shake that she's got. All right. 
looking behind to the doctor. I, if you want to, I, I don't know if I should, I feel like I need to go. When you start to look at the doctor, she's already looking right at you. And I don't know if you can read her expression, but she says, Trevor, whatever you want to do, I'm, well, I'm probably not at your side as I'm a little slow, but I'm behind you and I'm here to help. It's the least I can do. Wipes his chin slightly. Gives a little bit of a sharp inhale. Well, let's go then. Gives kind of a, not a sneer, but kind of half hard kind of smirk. As he gives a bit of a shrug and just turns back to uh, Nihilus and Esperanza. You said fifth floor? Quickly, this way. And he goes down the stairs. You go down the hall, passing the paintings on the walls, the ornate wallpaper, the flickering gas lanterns, and you get to the door of the stairwell and make your way down by one floor. And there you find the door to the fifth floor. No entry, it says on it. It's weathered, old, beaten, and has not been touched up. Ever. Maybe even that itself is superstition. The door is locked, as you could expect, There's no window, nothing to see through, but along the edges of the door you can feel that cold air blowing through, as if there's a draft. And Dr. Glass did bring the echo light with her. It's currently shedding light, and she looks around, and there's no one around, right? No, this stairwell is empty. She transfers it to her mage hand so that she has a hand free. The echo light floats in the air by your shoulder, held by the mage hand. Uh, Trevor's going to, uh, as we approach the door, just kind of go, oh well, do the right thing ain't always the fun thing, so uh, we just, he's going to reach out and test the door just to verify that it is indeed locked. You grab the handle, give it a turn, it doesn't rotate any more than a few centimeters. You shake the door a bit, and it's loose. It's not very well made to begin with. Just turn uh, over to uh, Esper. Every second counts, right? Uh, just, um, please, please be careful. Barely waits for Esper to finish the sentence before he backs up. And he's just going to do a big push kick of the door right up the, uh, right on the knob just to try and break it off the hinges. Roll athletics. Uh, Trevor going to town. That's a 23. <laughs> that doorknob does not stand a chance. That thing slams into the door frame, breaking, shattering wood splinters flying across the room. It breaks clean through. There's practically a hole in the door where the doorknob used to be, and the door is loose. In fact, as you do so, it slowly creaks open, revealing the hall to the fifth floor. The hall here is a little different than you saw earlier. In the floors below and in the floor above, still dated, but modern, elegant. The wallpaper, the lights, the carpeting, all ornate, beautiful colors of maroon red and gold. Here, it looks very old by your standards. Dr. Glass, you'd recognize having been on the island of Crow Perch in your early days, that it's of a different time for style. Here you see a mustiness in the air. The storm outside picks up, and you see the faded portraits on the walls of former guests. You see broken room keys scattered on the ground. An old guest book on the floor, 
just inside and to the right of the door. Its writing is illegible, almost like the sprawlings of a madman had taken hold and ridden through all the guest information. The sticky varnish, after years of degrading on the wallpaper, is first of note. There is a dusty taste in the air. Curtains rustle along windows that have been long boarded up, making this hallway dark, eerie, tension-filled. The floor itself creaks as you take your first step into it, and along both sides, you see rows of doors, each one closed, waiting to be revealed. Seeing the tension from everyone around, uh, Nihilus starts to, to hold his holy cross and begin a whisper as they continue to walk. Uh, for those listening in on a closer tone, they could hear it in clear words, but if you're not noticing, it's just a bit of prayerful whispering, uh, as he says. By the grace of Soros, I beseech thee to bestow thy radiant light upon this object, illuminating it with your sacred brilliance. May your holy presence imbue this holy tree with the power of illumination, guiding us in your divine wisdom and protection, as he casts the cantrip light on his holy cross in order to illuminate the room clearly. The light illuminates the room. It glows down these dark halls, and it reveals that, no, no problem, that that light illuminates, adding to the light of the echo light, further giving you more detail, seeing the peeling wallpaper damp and wet, the black, moldy stains on the walls as moisture built up over the years has degraded it. There's dust on anything that has a surface. The old oil lanterns on the walls are completely caked in it. You do see, however, now that there were footsteps along this old dust, and relatively recently, you can presume the most recent footprints are those belonging to Maggie, but there are some older sets as well. The dust kicks over two sets of footsteps that could be weeks old, maybe months. And interestingly, in the floor, this old wooden floor, you see carved in as if something heavy and sharp was dragged along all the way from your door to the door in the center it leads. The doors are numbered, 501 through 510, and in the center, a larger ornate door, 505. You're currently standing at 501, the first door in the hall. Dr. Glass gestures to everyone to, like, lean in to the echo light to, to listen. You know, we heard horrible sounds through the echo light before. And she's still exhausted and not not at, on her best game. And so she's hoping that someone will hear how bad things are. You see, you see them footprints, right? Hmm. Looks like we just follow them. We find her, right? Maggie? Yeah, yeah, Maggie. I would like to know what else we'll find if possible there there were those those other sounds when I was in the lobby earlier today I heard rumors about this place being haunted from a from a time in its past although I thought it was merely fictional let's find out for ourselves quickly let's all listen and see if we can hear how many entities were dealing with and I at least would like to do a perception check which I get advantage on I get a the echo light gives us advantage on sound based perception checks so for me that would be a straight roll since I have disadvantage on all skill checks right now if I may all right dr glass please roll for perception as a straight roll 
canceling out your advantage and disadvantage. Um, so I will just unequip the Echo Light briefly. Uh, and that is a 14 perception. You listen, the sounds amplified by the relatively cheap speaker that comes off of the Echo Light. And you hear first dripping somewhere in the walls, on the floor, in the rooms. It's hard to tell where it's coming from. You don't hear much else except it om- it's so fast it almost startles you, the noise. A scurry that seems to run through the vents of the building. You hear it first yourself and then everybody as it scurries through the walls to your right towards the center of the hall and then disappears in the distance. That clamoring, clanking sound through the metal ductwork. Oh, dear. And Wes, is the scurrying, it's sort of just around, it doesn't sound localized to 505, it's just horrifying and in the walls? It started in the wall near you. It's as if when you grabbed the echo light to listen in, it almost ran away from you towards the center of the the hallway and then disappears behind the walls. It's definitely following tracks, meaning this ductwork, whatever it is that's in the walls, there's only a few directions it can run to, but distinctly there is something in there and it doesn't run like a normal animal. It's slimy sounding. It, it doesn't clearly doesn't have a normal number of legs. The, the banging against the metal is irregular. On second thought, if we have committed to action, perhaps knowing less is better. <sighs> now you're talking my language. He's gonna kind of start uh, very slowly with a lighter foot than you expect from someone this big uh, is going to start like creeping, following the footsteps that appear to be Margaret's. Uh, kind of looking along the walls. The place just probably got rats. And he's just going to start slowly moving up. If you want to check the, the other doors, see if we're not getting creeped up on, that's fine. And then go see where this leads. Well, there's one more thing I could do, but it would take a few minutes. I could just cast about for, for magic generally, but we'd ha- you'd all have to sit here and wait. I, I'm not saying that's a bad idea, but when something's making a sound like tearing meat, I'm not so sure it would be magic. Yeah, I'm not sure. And we likely don't have time. We can wait forever. I don't know how long Maggie can wait. Very wise. I'll let the young, strong people take the lead on this one. Um, all right. And Esper will move up, still behind Trevor, but definitely on the more forward half of the group. I will say that Dr. Glass is watching uh, Esper curiously. She, I don't think she knows anything about Esper's abilities, and she notes that Esper identified as strong and as someone to take action. Trevor, you make your way to the front and follow both the footsteps and, as it turns out, that same carved-in damage to the wooden floor. They lead to the same place, room 505. The floor creaks as you take your first slow steps, moving to a regular gate, with Esperanza just behind you and the rest of the group. And as you approach the door, you see... The key is in it. It's turned as if unlocked, left behind. What do you do? Looking, uh, looking over at the the knob and the keyhole. Uh, is the keyhole one of those old-fashioned ones uh, with like the bulkier keys? It is. Yes. Mm. So. 
uh, theoretically, if one were to pull the key out, would one be able to look in the keyhole? With an old lock like this, certainly. Gonna look over at Esper and just whispering as quietly as he can. Just gonna go, I think I saw someone do this before. Let me see if this works. Uh, he's gonna very slowly reach a key, uh, reach for the key. Just rip out and just take it out of the keyhole. He'll, he'll pocket that. And he'll just sort of kneel down and start to try and peer through and see if he can get a peek at the other side. You put your hand onto the key and begin to pull it out. And at first it's met with a little bit of resistance. This is an old lock and an old key. That's to be expected. But as you begin to pull, you notice there is a fleshy sound to it. And as the key pulls out, you see veins, tendons, and meat pulling out with it through the hole. What in heaven's hills? If you let go of the key, it'll dangle from the keyhole on the door in front of you. Yeah, I think as soon as the key is out and is now hanging by this little strand, there's just like a and just drops the key, like completely lets go of it as it just sort of starts to swing from the keyhole. You can see in the hole, though. In fact, you see that there's a small light that shines through. Well, um... Well, I'd have to get all the way down there to look through the hole, so, you know, you're one of them short folk. Uh, why don't you take a look? (sighs) Then she'll slowly, without saying anything, kind of turn her body to face the door. She'll have to tippy-toe up a little bit and slowly bring her one of her eyes just closer. She is also shaking like a leaf. You get your eye towards the keyhole and you look through. And of course you see the key-shaped metal outline, the mechanism on the inside. And it doesn't just stop at the end of the keyhole, the other side that you see through, but It's as if you're looking through a small tunnel of red. And through that, you see a room. A large room. Two tables, massive in the center. Some staircases and doors on either side. It's even larger than the master suites you've been gifted on the top floor. This could be, could have been, the largest opulent master suite in the hotel though you notice something else on that table sitting in front of a table setting plates forks knives cups nothing in them you see maggie face down hunched over the table as if she was sitting ready for dinner her head on the plate you do see her torso rising and falling slowly as it looks like she's sleeping Esther's going to take a few seconds to seem to drink that in, and then slowly she's like almost, it's almost like her skin is pulling her away to back up, and she's going to bring a hand up to point at the the lock. Maggie's inside. Something, I think something is wrong with her. Well, uh, we ain't going to fix it out here. We have to go in. It it looks it looks strange. It, it sounds useless to say this, but it looks wrong. Right. Nihilus will grab the key from the floor, and in a very curious manner, he grabs the the fleshy tendrils connected to it as well, and starts to fiddle and smoosh it between his fingers to have a feel for the texture. Doctor Glass leans in a little bit to to watch what he's doing with interest. Magnifying glass. Yeah. (laughs) Why don't both of you roll a medicine check? For a total of 24 with a natural 20. Do you still want me to roll my disadvantage (laughs) check? 
Uh, I'll take Nihilus's natural 20, yeah. but you could roll one of your own. If you get a natural 20, maybe something cool will happen. Two natural 20s. Let's go. I got it. I did get a natural 20, but I have disadvantage on all checks, so I will have to take the 17 for a 22. Hmm. Nihilus, you rub this veiny material between your fingers hard enough to break it apart as it comes into its basic elements, the meat on your hands, and it pops almost like that of an old blood vessel. It's so fragile. A vein that would be inside of a human body. The blood on the inside is coagulated, thick, and rotten. It's clearly from a human. Or a humanoid, that is. He he takes a whiff to it, to the smell and the texture, and seeing how it bursts. He doesn't look horrified by it, but his movement is a bit slower as he's trying to be careful with it, as it does pop. This is... This is... This can't be. This is human. It's like it's a living organism living inside of the hotel itself. And if I wasn't surrounded by all of you, I'd thought it to be a mere nightmare. We'll have to get... We have to get her back. And he will grab the key and force through his own will continue and try to open the door as you push against the door turning the handle it clearly is unlocked and freely to open but it is hitting something something heavy you'd have to push it aside you could do so it's but it's you could guess 100 to 200 pounds laying right in front of the door mm-hmm. <laughs> and he kind of like looks back towards uh, Trevor. <laughs> Would you be a dear? <laughs> what? Opening the door? <laughs> you can see. You can definitely see how Nihilus's face and like his pressure. Like he's like leaning with full weight against the door at this point. That would be quite helpful if you if you could. <laughs> and he takes a step back. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know. Should have been a lock picker. This shit seems easy. I'm gonna back up. Uh, apparently, this is there's a lot of weight behind here, so let's give it uh, the old bull rush. And he's gonna go and he's gonna try and uh, bash his shoulder into the door frame. You force the door open. It drags open, and you see a red streak on the ground beneath it as it does so. As you fully open the door and take a small step into the room, you see what was barricading it. On the other side, an elf. Its head was slammed so heavily against the doorknob that it went clean through. It's sitting against the door, propped up. And just as the door stops from the force of being pushed open, it dislodges, slumping the body over onto the ground. Oh, I'm gonna be sick. Uh, uh, mm. Upon uh, shouldering open the door and seeing the the corpse kind of tumble, uh, Trevor kind of goes a a bit wide-eyed. Uh, seeing it happen and then seeing it dislodge from the doorknob um he just kind of goes speechless a a quick gasp before uh still wide-eyed he's like staring down the corpse before he kind of shakes his head and he like almost wasn't there for half a second before he comes back to reality um and he just starts uh now that it's open He just kind of gives a little uh, reflexive kick to the corpse, not to, like, damage it or anything, but almost like a push with his foot to get it away from him. And just starts, like, looking around, uh, scanning for, like, he's in full fight or flight mode right now and is just scanning his environment. You frantically look through the room. Now, you notice two things. On both sides of that door you entered from, stairwells, one leading up and one leading down. Judging by the layout of the hotel, it's possible that on the floors above and below were areas that didn't have entryways. 
There in the center of the room, you see two large tables. Clearly you could see eight, maybe nine, ten people. On either side, you see open doorways. No doors, just archways where one could walk through. A sitting area, a kitchen, a fireplace. This is enormous and ornate. It's dusty, but you see the dust has been cut through with not footsteps, but almost like a slithering or something has passed through this area numerous times. And as you look up to the right by the door, metal ductwork is open to the rest of the building. In the middle, you see Maggie slumped over the table and seems to be asleep. Our Dr. Glass now does tell everyone that she points up at the ductwork and she says, I have heard something unpleasant slithering away, something I didn't recognize. And Wes, the, the poor elven person on the doorknob, are they connected to the key? Like, is the key of them? At least what was stuck to the key was a piece of viscera from their head. Esper, who had gone back for a moment after we opened the door to looking first at the corpse, but then very particularly to everybody else, eventually sets her eyes back on the thing that she originally saw in the room. And she's going to begin to inch closer to the tables. Uh, Miss, Miss Maggie? You inch closer. You see she's asleep. Roll a medicine check as you approach her, as you look her over. Now that is a 13 minus 1 for 12. She's pale, though her cheeks have some color to them. She seems asleep, but even with the noise you make approaching, completely unstirred. From the other room, you hear a skitter, and it stops just a second as it makes sound and then disappears. Doctor, um, can you can you check on her? See if she's okay. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna keep an eye on this vent. We can't leave this room. Those stairs, he's pointing to either side of the room. We go up together. We don't separate. Keep eyes on all entrances and exits. Ex- excellent thinking. Why don't the three of you watch the three entrances? Esper is going to uh, break out of her stare of the doctor and begin to nod her head and then just reach up to the table and grab the first object that she can before wandering to an unoccupied thing to be watching. She has a fork. The room is colder than the rest of the hotel was. In fact, so much so you can see the breath in front of your face. There's a draft. It comes across the room, vertically down the tables and towards the door you opened to enter. The body in the center doesn't stir as one typically might while asleep as Esper approaches. Something's off about it, that's for sure. And that skittering that at this point picks up again, but now from the other side, picks up and stops again as... A slithering, pattering sound, a combination of body, slime, and feet pattering against the floor and then disappearing again. It's, as far as you can tell, a dangerous place. And while we're at it, I sent everybody a link. Mm -hmm. You'll find your tokens on a map. This is the room you're in. And while we're at it, please everybody roll a wisdom saving throw with disadvantage. Mm. Cool. So straight for me. (laughs) And while you're making these rolls, you begin to feel a charge in the air. The taste of metallic electricity, not so different from the taste of blood. The room begins to fill with a a mist, but you don't 
feel that change in air. You can only begin to guess that it's your senses that are causing this, not necessarily reality. Please, everybody, tell me your saving throws. Eleven for Nihilus. Nineteen for Dr. Glass. Nineteen for Trevor. Eight for Esper. Esper and Nihilus, as you stand in this room, you begin to feel a sensation, a compulsion almost. You begin to feel a little bit tired. Your head, your hands, your body starts to feel heavy. You feel as though if you don't catch yourself soon, you'll fall over. While this is happening, Trevor and Dr. Glass, you can see as Nihilus and Esper start to look a bit odd. Their pupils dilate, their skin begins to fade into a flush white color. Mm. Oh shit. I don't, f- I don't feel so well. Doctor, I... I shouldn't... Why am I so tired? Everyone stay calm. Uh, as this is happening, uh, as Trevor is noticing Esper and Nihilus both starting to feel a little off, does it look like they're about to, like, uh, collapse, or... Nihilus like, looks like he's about to hurl all over you. Yeah. As a few seconds goes by, and you see as they start to nod, keeping themselves awake, they're struggling, they're blinking heavily to try not to fall asleep, but it's happening quickly. Nihilus, Esper, step outside the room, at least. I would also, if I could add, um, as apparent as it was that Esper was scared earlier, the fact that she has begun to become drowsy, as if she is going to fall asleep, has her terrified. She is becoming a little more erratic in her movements, even though they are notably more sluggish, and she will lurch to turn around and go the other way towards the door. Doctor, I don't, I don't want to s- s- sleep right now. Both of you, out of this room, out the, out the way we came. Get some air. Immediately. Doctor's orders. Quite all right. I had, I had, a, I had a large cup of coffee earlier today, and it's merely its side effects. Trevor, get them out of here. Don't make me force you. Trevor is looking uh, around. Uh, you said that uh, there was clearly an open vent visible. Uh, is Where is that uh, in the room? The door you walked in... On one side, there is an oil-burning lantern. On the other, a hole in the wall where the vent is visible. Okay. On the left, to the left from your perspective on, of on that front door. On the left side. Okay. Uh, he's going to uh, hold on to Nihilus uh, and is going to slowly start to shuffle him behind Trevor, which would put him closer to the door if uh, Nihilus were to allow him. Mm, certainly, certainly. He's like a weak puppet doll f- following around right now. It, it looks like he, he's not even sure where he's walking right now. It looks like he's hazy and daisy. He's in full bodyguard mode right now and is just going to slowly uh, shuffle Nihilus behind him and is just going to start eyeing that vent. Uh, using what little information that he's been given, that's probably the, the main thing. Might be something in the air he doesn't know, but he heard that from the doctor that there's scuttling coming from that vent and he's just going to slowly start to inch his way toward uh, the vent. You do so, Trevor, as you walk towards the vent and as you look up inside of it, you see a black ichor-like slime that cakes up on the corners on either side of that vent as if something runs through here regularly. It's dented and battered from the inside all the way throughout. And along the wall, that ichor drips down the wallpaper and pools at the ground. If... uh, I must say, (coughs) with this particular interesting foundings that we have, uh, there was reported a, a, a multitude of people missing. If it is Presumably, this elf, <coughs> that is one of them, there must be more. Please get get her to talk. <laughs> and as that happened, Nihilus 
falls over, unconscious. Could I attempt something? Sure. And you feel your consciousness fading in and out, so you know you only have a second at most, or two. Esper, fully gripped by the fear, is going to lift her hand and jab the fork into her palm. You do so. It strikes the meat of your palm, piercing through. Blood immediately starts to flow out, giving yourself what you can tell. It, the, the pain, it jolts you awake, but only temporarily. It's like you slapped yourself in the face to stay awake just a bit longer, and perhaps you have ten seconds more, but that, that sleep, that magical sleep, seems to continue to push its way through your consciousness. She's going to use that time, however unbalanced she is, to try and jolt towards the door out of here. You run towards the door, opening it, stumbling into the hallway, and everybody sees as Esper knocks over some of the plates, candelabras on the table, you know, jumping past Trevor along the way. And as she steps into the hallway, you see her start to slouch. Esper, you hit the wall on the other side, realizing you took a few too many steps as everything goes black, and Esper, too, falls over into the hallway. At this point, on the opposite end of the room, Dr. Glass and Trevor, you hear a growling noise behind the wall, behind the door, and a slithering, stepping sound as the door starts to open slowly. And there you see this snake, human-like amalgam of a creature. Its skin is scaled. It emits a slime. It has five legs, all in strange places along its body, nowhere you'd expect a face is nowhere to be seen except for one red dot. A ball, equally as slimy on the front, that you can only presume to be its eye. Both of you at this moment, please roll another wisdom saving throw with disadvantage as it steadily makes its way through the door, stepping onto the table and pulling its heavy body up along with it. You got this. Come on. Come on. Oh, no. Four. Ten. Trevor, it walks towards you. It walks across the table. Its form is almost mesmerizing. It's bizarre and unexpected. That red eye reflects you as you look into it, and you feel the drowsiness starting to come over. You can only presume... You have a second or two, and as it approaches, you fall asleep. Top, run, and just collapse onto the, onto one of the uh, seats. Doctor Glass, behind you, Esper lay on the ground. In front of you, Nihilus and Trevor, just fell over as well, and you know this is coming for you as well. And the most bizarre thing, you begin to hear music. It's beautiful and ornate. A piano of the most expensive make. You can hear the reverberations of each keystroke, the skill of the artist playing it. And you're not sure when this happened, but... You stand at the end of one of the tables of this room, and it's set, candelabras and candles glowing. The food is astounding. Meat of all kinds, vegetables, line this table like a cornucopia of feasting. The carpet, red, gleaming, the walls, bear portraits of old. You can tell that this is a different time, 
a lot like when you were a child. And sitting at the table, you see Maggie, Trevor, Esperanza, and Nihilus. You recognize that something has happened. In fact, all of you know that this is not where you were. This is something else. Like a dream, but somehow you're all sharing it. A butler walks through the front door. Madame? Sir? Madame? Sir? Madame? I hope you enjoy tonight's dinner. It is absolutely my pleasure, on behalf of everybody at the Whaler, to welcome your group. Crow Perch is beautiful today. The weather is what you'd expect. Stunning, warm, and sunny as always. And the mines open soon. So, you best make your meal quick if you plan to make preparations with all of the other travelers who come here. And she looks at him because she knows she cannot dream and cannot be forced to dream. And she wonders if that gives her some sort of power over whatever magic this is. Like it's almost a lucid dream. So I say it's like a sleep. Um, you can tell... It's, it's, it's not a dream, it's an illusion. Mm -hmm. She's not asleep. Mm -hmm. You feel awake. But she looks around. Is that oil lamp still here? There's one hanging on the wall next to the door. There's two candelabras on the table, and your echo light is nowhere to be seen. The one by the door, is it in the same place that you'd said there was an oil lamp burning before? It looks like the same oil lamp, but it looks brand new. It's glass not shattered, it's metal untarnished. Does it seem odd to her or significant to her? The last thing she was planning to do before all this was to extinguish that lamp. And she's she's trying to remember that. She's struggling to remember that. But now this music is distracting her. She plays piano, after all. Uh, the, the lamp is lit. You could extinguish it. Uh, what is Dr. Glass at this point doing? Well, there's no echo light, so her mage hand is free. And so she's going to smile at the person who just greeted her and reach up and extinguish the oil lamp. Is there anything else I can get you for your meal before I leave you to your adventures? Uh, dear waiter, before you go, <coughs> I must have dozed off. I'm not in my proper mind. But are we the first group to venture in here on this fine evening? Tonight? Yes. We haven't had travelers here in quite some time. And yet here we have five. As you look over and you see Maggie sitting at the table. Right. L looking over at Maggie, she's awake as well. And lucid? Um, excuse me. I don't... Oh, I believe I saw you. You checked into the hotel before... I. It seems to be fading so quickly, I... Are you all right? Never mind. I don't even know where I was going with that. And what happened to our host? She asks the waiter. Are, are we... Are we here to see the king? Your host is Mr. Harland Usher. Of course, he's in his office right now. But he has an open-door policy. You're welcome to check in. Very gracious. Uh, there's uh, a sharp... Uh, scraping noise as just like as uh, Trevor immediately stands up from the chair um what where are we this ain't this ain't right you're in the master suite of the Whaler Hotel um I could draw a bath if you're not feeling well your other guests seem to still be waking up and as he says that one of the doors open uh, to one of the other rooms in this mansion of a suite. And stepping out of it, you see a beautiful woman 
flowing blonde hair. This outfit from a different era, but stunning nonetheless. She seems to have just finished her lipstick as she steps out and closes a pocket mirror and steps towards the table. Ah, darlings! Darlings, darlings. Another wonderful day at Crow Perch. Uh, pleasure to make the acquaintance. I'm sorry, who are you? I'm surprised. I, well, I best not dwell on it. Eliza Montgomery. You might know me from some of my works, but most recently, Midnight Whispers. I'm very excited to finally meet somebody who doesn't recognize me. I'll be honest. Yes, I'm not from this continent even, so I do apologize for any rude remarks. Uh, I am not feeling myself today, it seems. I don't even remember going in this room, to be fair. Uh, do we have the... What, what, <clears throat> how do, why do we owe the pleasure of your presence with us tonight? Is this a special occasion? Well, yes. Every day is a special occasion. But today in particular, we're going to be celebrating our premiere. We've been working on this film for a long time. And I'm just very proud of it, is all. And across the room from another doorway, another man emerges. This one with a slick black haircut to the side. Also vintage, from another era, smoking something, perhaps a rolled cigarette of sorts. And he looks across and gives an eye towards Miss Eliza. Ah, good morning, Eliza. So good to see you today. You're looking beautiful as ever. Oh, Adrian. Um, could I ask, would Esper know that this is not one of her typical dreams? Absolutely. I think everybody is feeling lucid. Um, surprising because the one person who clearly isn't is Maggie. And doc is Dr. Glass familiar with Midnight Whispers? And I mean, would we all have heard of this movie? Do we know what movies are? Roll a history check with advantage. Which would make it a straight roll for me right now. Uh, that is a dirty 20. It was a long time since you've been in Crow Perch, but when you were here, say, 30 years ago, roughly, is that right? More, uh, like, 45, 50 years ago. Trevor is just looking around like, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills, just seeing everyone going along with this. Yeah, Dr. Glass throws a wrench in the works of, like, 30 years ago sounds like a lot, and now it's not, <laughs> because she is 61 years old. <laughs> Esper notably has said absolutely nothing. She is, in fact, uh, she's she's basically curled herself into a ball in this oversized seat for herself, and she is covering her eyes with her hands. Nihilus is in a resting, confused face with one eyebrow slightly raised in a non-stop manner as he keeps trying to eye the situation. Dr. Glass, you remember when you were a young child, walking through the halls of the Whaler Hotel, one conversation stood out to you because it wasn't as optimistic and cheery as everything on the island was at the time. It was a sad conversation, mournful. You heard two employees of the hotel at the time, and Midnight Whispers comes to mind. One was saying to the other, It's too bad about the fifth floor. I can't believe they've shut it down. But to think all over that poor tragedy of the cast of Midnight Whispers. Well, we'll worry about it another time. It's old news, as one might say. That's what you remember hearing. She is going to use a spell slot to cast... I hope she can cast spells within this. She's going to cast Detect Magic to try to find the thing to break, the switch to throw, to find some way to change what's happening. 
And so hopefully behind their back, while the actors are focused on each other and everyone's looking at Eliza Montgomery's beautiful lipstick, she's going to cast Detect Magic. You cast Detect Magic. And I believe there's verbal, somatic components. People can see you doing this. Uh, Eliza, for one, you hear from her from the sideline. Oh, magic. How delightful. I see that so rarely nowadays. And as you cast it, you see some items do glow with a magical eminence to them. Her pocket mirror, for one. And in the other room, you see a dagger. It, it's hard to see through the wall, because all you get is that magical outline. But it seems to be squirreled away in one of the bookshelves. You understand, for some reason, this Detect Magic is interacting with the world you're experiencing. In, in the meantime, while uh, Dr. Glass is performing the spell and Eliza is reacting, um, Trevor is just sort of like looking around. He goes, no, 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 no. Uh, there, there was a, a man there. Uh, with a hole in his head, there was, you was sleeping, there was a creature, I saw a creature. The man sits down at the table next to you. You've been watching too many films, my boy. Sits down and grabs his fork and knife and takes one of the helpings from the center. You're a liar. Don't listen to anything that they tell you. They are, they are lying. This, this is wrong. This is the wrong that I, I thought that there was. We need to go. She's gonna look right to the man at the table and goes, "You're not, you're not real. You are not." Um, sorry to say, dearie, but I'm just going to enjoy my meal. Is she all right? And as he says this, another man walks in from the room to the north. Oh dear, another. This one. Brown hair brushed to the side, also just as elegant, elegantly dressed and beautiful as the other woman who walked in. Well, uh, is everybody here okay? He steps in. Oh, Gregory, so wonderful to see you. She dons a less polite tone. Why don't you have breakfast? We have work to do. All right. He sits down. Don't eat any of that. Uh, gonna turn over to uh, Maggie. Just say, uh, don't eat any of that. Uh, just gonna slowly, since he stood up from sleeping, uh, he's gonna walk over to uh, to Maggie and just literally push her plate away from her. Oh, um, okay. I I wasn't very hungry anyway. She stands. Hmm. I'm not sure what I plan to do today. Breakfast. I thought it was evening. You need to leave. We have to go. We have to go, Miss Maggie. We're leaving. Well, let's go. She looks towards the door. Dr. Glass is just using this nice distraction to kind of stealth towards the room with the dagger. Please continue. You excuse yourself from the table, step away, and you don't notice any eyes or any particular attention cast towards you. You can walk towards that room relatively unnoticed. The door there is a large wooden oak door, black swirls in the wood. And as you open it, you do so, I imagine, silently. You're trying not to be noticed. And inside, you see yet another man, a half-orc. Um, oh, room service. I. He rubs his eyes. I'm up. I'm up. Thank you for I, the wake-up call. I didn't need it. Um, so is this a bedroom? This looks to be a bedroom. A bookshelf is there, and your detect magic, which is still at this point, gleaming the silhouette of a blade behind some of the books. Uh, yes, very astute. I am clearly the housekeeper. So sorry to interrupt. Please close your eyes again, and I will just uh, dust these books very quickly. Uh, I'm up anyway. He stands and in his pajamas, he 
whips the blankets off of him and steps towards the door to walk past you out into the dining area. Everybody else sees as he emerges. Dr. Glass, you go towards the bookshelf, revealing a small knife. It's silvered, beautifully carved, expensive of make, and it's metal. It uh, glistens. It's magical, that's for sure. Pings on your detect magic, that is. And it feels real. Certainly. It's beautifully silvered. It's cold to the touch. I put it in my pocket. And I return to the room. Please add a silvered blade to your inventory. And still confused. Please with herself, but uh, no more illuminated. She returns to the main room and uh, fixes her eye on that pocket mirror. So I do have a couple of questions. I'm not that quite familiar in the works of films or its projects. How long does it take to uh, create one such film, and what is it about? Now he's asking the good questions. You mind, Eliza? No, no. I know you love talking about these things. Of course. All right. Uh, what's your name, sir? Um, Nihilus von Stone. Uh, uh, which one are you again, All right, sir? Nihilus. Yeah, yeah. I'm Adrian Mitchell. I'm the director. He reaches over and shakes your hand. All right. So, you know those uh, magic powers for, for recording things and playing them back. Well, we basically take a number of, we'll call them uh, recipient items, to take a small snippet of sound and sight. We run them very quickly side by side. As each scene plays through, we swap it out. And that is how you make a crude, I'll be honest, crude Motion picture. That's, uh, how long, long does it take to uh, the, the entire project of one such film? What, what year did you start it at? Oh, this? We've been working on this one all year. We're premiering it tonight. Um, Eliza there, if you haven't met her, she is the star of the show, Eliza Montgomery. Remember that name because it's going to be famous one day. Gregory Thornton there, of course, co-star. And uh, my friend here, Constantine... He is our guide to the island. He's the half-orc. He's showing us around. Constantly. The name does sound familiar. Hmm. Um, well, why do we in particular owe the pleasure of meeting these to-be stars on this fine morning? Well, uh, perhaps luck. I'm not sure. You're staying here with us. Uh, from what I remember, you have been. So I really can't speak for why you're here on the island. But from what I hear, the mines are what draw most people. I assume that's why you're here. It's been bountiful. There's this resource that's been discovered. Um, they're calling it broom, but don't take my word for it. I, I don't know for sure. Uh, it's not why I'm here. That's... But it's been drawing people to the island like crazy. And so we thought, why not premiere it here? But the, the, the mines have been open for many a year, are they not? About three. And he looks towards the rest. Of, he looks towards the rest of the party, and in a rude, crude manner, he kind of ignores the rest, and he asks the party, "Are we in a memory of the past?" <laughs> Mentally, in, into his mind, the glasses. Yes, Nihilus. And how long have you all been visiting this hotel then? Well, I just checked in a few days ago. Eliza here has been here for a week. She has the time off anyway, so... Yes, I've been enjoying it. The beaches are wonderful. I love these little shops. The boardwalk, don't get me started. We shan't, dear. Wes, I know this is an obnoxious question that DMs hate, but was there a particular school of magic that Dr. Glass clocked off those two items? You notice that the dagger is enchantment, and the pocket mirror, divination. I, then, before there's popping off, she is going to say, oh, That's such a lovely pocket mirror. Did you acquire that at the shops? Oh, no. I've had this with me for quite some time. I got it while I was in the Sovereign Sea Gate. There was a magic shop there that sold it to me. Oh, it's magical. 
Yes, of course. I mean, maybe not of course. It's not so obvious, I think. Um, but it allows me to make sure that I do my makeup quite perfectly. It shows me what I should look like, and I copy it. Should according to whom? Well, I suppose according to my desires. I, I will say, whenever I look into it, I see exactly as I wish to look. And I copy that, and there I am. I can't say, look, I can't say that my acting career has been affected by this, but when I started using it, I drew more eyes, I got more attention, and could show my skills better, so I'll give it some credit. Well, don't draw too many more eyes, dear. I think you look lovely with just the two. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right back. And she goes into the empty bedroom and casts detect thoughts and returns. And meanwhile, Nihilus, he was starting to write down all the names in a small notepad that he kept on his pocket. And then he asks openly to the room, and who again is this Harland Usher? The butler speaks up, who's been standing next to the door. Yes, Harland. Harland is our proprietor. He founded this wonderful establishment. He keeps all aspects running on time, on schedule, and as expected. And likely is the reason why this place is a landmark now. The Whaler, built in the center of the new Port Hillcrest. And he looks Maggie dead in the eye. Uh, say, Maggie, what is your profession? I... Well, that's... I know I worked at the Salted Stout for some years. I was a waitress. The Salted Stout. Uh, tavern nearby, right? Yes, that's that's the one. Hmm. I thought it was still under construction. But that's yeah, interesting. Who was who was was that Adrian or Gregory? That was Adrian Mitchell, the director. And by the way, as you cast Detect Thoughts, as you direct it in any direction, it's like the chattering of a crowd. You can't pick up one voice over the other. She basically wants to know, she's because she can't trust her regular insight right now because she's so tired. She wants to know why Eliza does not like Gregory as much as she likes Adrian. Okay. How are you trying to ascertain that information? How are you trying to figure it out? I think we might have to come back to that uh, okay. since I don't want to interrupt the Nihilus conversation. just thought if he was talking to Gregory, but he's not. As Nihilus is writing down all the notes in his notebook, he kind of flips it back close and he looks over the readily agitated Trevor, if that is a correct uh, reaction. He closes it. Oh yeah, he's flabbergasted. And he gives a thumbs up. That's all I needed. I Listen, uh, I don't care if we're in a, a, a memory of the past, like, like you said, pointing over at Nihilus. Uh, you said uh, this this usher guy. He he's in charge. He's he's actually walking over to Adrian, and he's going to like grip him by the lapels. Um, yes, sir. What is the meaning of this? Where is he? You said open door policy. I want to walk through this open door. Yeah, yeah. He's head out the door and right up to his office. There's nothing stopping you. I don't know why you're putting this on me. Sets him down. What does Gregory think about Adrian being threatened? Does he like it? <laughs> Gregory sits back in the chair at the table with his feet on the corner. And he puts a small grin on the side of his mouth. You see Eliza rolling her eyes as if it's not the first time Adrian has somehow found himself in a pickle. But <laughs> perhaps she looks a bit surprised because she can't even clock what he did this time. I'm going there. Anyone who's leaving might want to follow me. He begins to make for the door. You do so. You begin to walk towards the door. What is everybody else doing? Are they following or not? Nihilus gets up and follows, having a a last look back at Maggie, but with a, with a sad grin on his face, he just continues to follow Trevor, leaving her in her fate. Douglas is going to follow, but since she spent the spell slot, she wants to try to find out who's the bad guy here. Uh, my cat is about to join us. Don't step on the... 
since she spent the spell slot, Dr. Glass does want to find out who's the bad guy amongst the cast. Uh, and so she she's sticking with Eliza. She's got her detect thoughts focused on Eliza. Uh, and, just, and she says, well, that was a bit alarming, but uh, I believe his name is Gregory, seemed a bit amused to see your friend Adrian get roughed up. Yes, well, she... Uh, actually, would you roll a, a quick persuasion check? I just want to put a pulse on this conversation. I'm trying. <laughs> roll for Riz. I just want to get her thinking about it so I can hear those thoughts. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's the first one, but I have disadvantage. Of course, the first one was excellent. And now I can't. The cat is blessing your rolls. Uh, you should have blessed the second one, Kat. So that's a nine persuasion. All right. She gives you a light smile and pulls you to the side. She stands from the table. Come here, darling. Why don't I show you my room? And she walks over to the door and pushes it open. You see two beds in it and uh, a fireplace. And she steps in, guiding you that way. All right. Look, I don't want the tabloid gossip, so this stays between us. But since we'll be living together, you might as well know. Adrian and I, we, we've been enjoying each other's company. And I think Gregory is a bit unhappy. He, let's just put it this way. He thinks it's something less than professional and it bolsters my career. But we really do have something, darling. I hope that's enough information for you, darling. I don't want to put you through the the mud of gossip. But So Gregory's not a, a bad fellow or anything. He's just concerned for the work. I've been working with Gregory for years. He'll get over it. He always does. I just you know, I'm a bit of an I can't I'm a bit of an auntie. I can't help it. I see a, a lovely young woman like you, and I want to make sure she's doing okay, surrounded by all these men. She puts her hand on your shoulder. That's so sweet. I... You'll be my auntie. I won't take anything else. She smiles at you. Uh, might I borrow your mirror just briefly to check my own maquillage? Oh! Of course. She hands it over. I don't know much about these things, but with some of the artifacts that are found, they require some time to get used to. Not this oh, one. Yes. It works just as well. Uh, why don't you take a look? And she opens the mirror and hands it to you. And yes, I, I take a peek. Please describe Isadora Glass in her best form as much as could be, because that is what she sees. Ooh. She sees eyes. Eyes and cheekbones and rosy lips. Rosy lips that don't need lipstick, as she was told in her youth, though she does enjoy lipstick. But the biggest thing she sees is her green gray eyes and in this mirror the light hits them perfectly so that there is a sheen of starlight uh, and her hair is perfectly her curls fall perfectly to frame her angular face quite as interesting is it not it uh, takes me back when I cared about such things. Well, it's it's useful. It wasn't expensive. One of a kind, though. I guess to those who look for items, one like this doesn't have much value. Who sold it to you? Oh, just some some vendor over in Sovereign Seagate. I truly don't even remember. It was so long ago. Do I feel like this is a very powerful object and actually should have been expensive? 
Roll Arcana. Let me rest. So I can be good at skills again. Okay. Uh, 15 plus 14 is 19, so that's not bad. It must have value to some. And in this case, it probably found its best owner, to be frank. Somebody who needs to focus on their appearance at all times. It's a party trick, unless it has practical use. But you do get to see how you would look best in the best light, with the best makeup, to your best desire. I guess I got lucky. But I still have use for it. When I retire, I can give it to you. If you like. I hope you're anyway. not retiring soon enough to give it to me, darling. Oh. With this movie? I... I may. It's a tough industry. And this is slated to do very well. It might be my big hit. I don't know. I have, uh... She leans in. I have another director as well who is looking into me. So I may be switching teams. Oh, thank you for giving me the inside gossip. You know, as aunties love gossip. Could you tell me a little more? Oh, uh, no, nothing to tell. Vincent O'Malley is another... He's not a name, but he will be. Believe me, I've seen his work. It's amazing. But wait, Adrian... I wish he could come. I, in I invited him, but... Adrian is your director now, is he not? Your... I love Adrian, don't get me wrong, and I hope that when I tell him, he'll understand. But you're not sure? I'm... I'm pretty sure. Look, I... I've been doing this for the... I hate to say it. I've been doing this for the money for a while, and... I just... I want to make art again. Adrian's popular, and he's a doll. But... Vincent makes art. Are you planning to tell him tonight, by any chance? I thought once the screening happens, everybody sees how successful this is going to be. He'll be too much on a high, riding his hard work. He should take it well. I know him well enough by now. Well, you, I, I trust you and your instincts, uh, but... I wish I could convince you to wait and write him a letter from the set of your new film. That's quite the idea. I might do that. I'll think about it anyway. Please do. Of course. Now, I, I do have to get ready. Uh, I have a quick walk with a friend, and then I have to come back and doll up for the event tonight. Yes, and that... That, uh, dashing half-orc gentleman, he's in the film as well? No, no, he's employed by the production. They wanted somebody to show us around, keep us safe as well. He knows his way around a, a fight. And, um... Ah, oh, I see. Yeah, he, he has taken us on some tours of the island. He's obviously staying here with us for protection. And... He also tends to his own business. I don't know much of it. But you've all been staying here the entire time? Yes. I mean, I stayed at a small house on the shore when I was here originally. But once everybody else from the production showed up, I had to gang up in crew quarters. Uh, thank you, Ms. Montgomery. It's been so charming meeting you. Of course, Auntie. Anyway, and she goes over to her walk-in closet. Oh, and I'll be taking that back. Oh, yes, of course. She goes to grab the pocket mirror. And she leaves into the closet. I'm so tempted to lock her into the closet for her own safety. Yeah, no, I think I'll go catch up with the group now. As best I can. <laughs> Trevor, as you're walking down the hall, I take it, Esper, you're joining as well? Uh, Esper is not going to leave Dr. Glass alone, but she also didn't leave the table yet. She is, um... She is making attempts to persuade Maggie to come along. Yes, I mean, I have nothing better to do today. In fact, I don't even recall what I had intended, so I don't mind coming along. Yes, it's 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 a very nice hotel. I I think it'd be really great to take a look. 
Doctor Doctor Glass, do you want to come as well? Yes, I'm 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 right here, dear. Don't fret. Come come here, Maggie. And and Esper's gonna reach her hand up an offering to Maggie. Yes, I'm coming. She grabs the hand begrudgingly, stands up, and steps away from the table to follow you along towards Trevor. And Trevor as you walk down the hall, you get towards not an elevator. There weren't any at this time. Mm-hmm. You get to a grand staircase that leads up, following behind you eventually, the rest of the group, and you make your way up, and something catches your eye. A portrait on the wall is a picture of the black bulls. All of them, for that matter. As he's like, he's basically stomping his way down the hallway. Uh, those who are uh, trailing behind him can see he's a man on a mission. And then, as soon as like the vaguest glimpse of it hits his peripheral vision, he, it's like he hits a wall. And he just stops. His head slowly turns to look at it. takes a beat and once again it's like he's not here this goes on for probably about 10 seconds waiting for the rest of them to catch up with him Silas is standing patiently next to you you will be able to tell on his face that he doesn't necessarily seem disturbed but there's this uneasy look on his face as if it's desire it's it is an extreme desire to to catch the truth and it's him not understanding it at least yet is like a dagger in his side it, it's extremely frustrating to him dr glass looks up when she catches up looks up at the portrait curious about what trevor's looking at does i suppose i wouldn't know this but does everyone see what i see yes they see a picture of everybody standing next to the campfire that was taken a while back. And you see yourself, slightly younger, cheerier version, standing in the center, arms around two of them. What is this here? And he's recognizable to us all, I imagine. Though younger. Though younger, yes, that's Trevor. The tattoo's a pretty good giveaway. <laughs> uh, that is you, is it not, Trevor? He doesn't say anything in response. He just sort of gives a nod. Have something you want to share? No. Have Have you never been here before? <sighs> no. We need to get to the bottom of this. Preferably quick. I'm sorry, Trevor. Don't look at it. It's... Why not? Because it will only serve to disturb you. It's invading our minds. That's what it wants. I'm not disturbed. That's the happiest I ever was. He's going to slowly shake his head. He's going to look across to uh, the corridor where he started to walk. Office of Harland Usher, written on one of the doors just ahead of you. Let's go. Right. He just sort of whispers under his breath and just makes his way to the door. He doesn't bother knocking, he's just opening the door. You open the door to his office. It's stunning. Massive table in the middle, carrying a globe. Maps sprawled out. They look a bit like gimmicky adventurer's maps that aren't actually used, just there for aesthetic purposes. You see paintings on the wall, you see a stunning desk, crow wood of the highest quality, hand carved. The windows show outside of the hotel. They're large and ornate in their own right, some stained glass elements, some not. And what you see is a beautiful sunny sky. The sun, all the way in the distance, oddly enough, it has a black spot in the center of it. It doesn't seem to change the lighting or blot the light, but it doesn't look like it does normally. 
As you open the door, he has an open door policy after all, Harland Usher stands up from his desk, arms wide, a smile that could draw in a crowd, pencil mustache, and he openly invites your company. Gentlemen, ladies, beautiful to see you tonight. Today, rather. Gosh, I've been working the midnight oil, one might say. How can I help you today? I hope everything is to your liking here at the hotel. I wouldn't have otherwise. So he seems well. He seems... He's not at all like Maggie. No, and if I remember correctly from last session, he's far less deceased than was originally described in the last session. Trevor, being the first one to enter, he stops for a moment. Uh, Let's... Usher finish his speech and just turns back behind. He realizes that he's not in a stable state of mind. So he is looking behind him to see what the rest of the people are doing. And if they're being passive, he's going to start marching forward. I think Dr. Glass is watching. Nothing has attacked us so far. She thinks... The goal has probably been achieved, that the goal is just to keep us here. So she's not... She she wants more information. She doesn't... So she, yeah, she'll let Trevor do his thing. Uh, Esper is clasping Maggie's hand in one hand, and if it's still in this plane, she probably still has a fork in her other hand. Is it the utensils? I have others as well, miss... I think, I think I will keep this one. Thank you. Of course, they're free to use, and you can take it with you as well. Trevor is going to start advancing uh, down uh, across the floor to the. Uh, is he like seated at a desk, or? He was when he stood up. He pushed his chair out and sprawled his arms to be as inviting as possible. He walks around his desk and towards the center, leans on the table where the globe is. Well, tell me about your stay. You're here for a reason. I'm here to help. He uh, goes right up against the desk and he's just like got his hands braced against the desk uh, with, you know, he was walking there with such force that he almost causes it to shift as he like suddenly stops himself on the desk itself. You're in charge. All right. Where are we? What is this? This ain't where we were. And you're going to explain where we are right now. Yeah, yeah. Hold your horses. He picks up a book from the desk in the middle. A copy of the Testimonium Veritas. Ooh. Fans through it lightly and uh, puts it down. You are in the Whaler Hotel on the beautiful island of Crow Perch with sunny, fantastic weather on the outside and guests clamoring to get to the Citadel, to see the mines, see what opportunities await, enjoy the beaches, the food, the ambiance, and the shops. You are in possibly the most beautiful place on the planet. Trevor's hand is going to lunge forward, uh, trying to grab at the book he now has in his hand. If he had his eyes in the book for even a moment, he's going to try and not grab the book from him, but just sweep it out of his hands and just get him to drop it. Oh! Careful with that. That's on me, motherfucker. Yes, yes. (laughs) Sorry. Um, He, the book flies across the room, hits the the wall, and he turns to you, and he keeps that confident expression on his face, but he looks a little bit startled. That ain't where we are. That ain't where we are. You're lying to me. How do we get out? While this happens, Dr. Glass... You notice that dark spot in the sun starting to shake a little bit. And nobody else notices this, but there is a very slight tremor, a small earthquake, very minor, that shakes the glasses, the tables, chairs, and it goes as quickly as it comes. Okay? I'm happy to answer your questions. I... I will be more specific. Sir, I I apologize. We are in my office on the top floor of the Whaler Hotel. 
you've come to see me here, and... We aren't looking for where. You're lying about when we are. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, this might be a terrible idea. I would like to slip Esper the silver, the little silver blade I found. Because she identified herself as strong, which I am not. And I don't think I'm going to be very useful with this. But I think we might need it in the near future. All right. More specifically, we are in the 15th age. We just transitioned. It's 15A01. What? You think you're fucking funny? That's not right. I, I try, I'm trying my best not to be funny, sir. I promise you. Why do you have that painting out back? Uh, our paintings come from all over the world. I've imported them from anywhere I could get my hands on. I like my guests to be, to feel that our hotel is special. And so that's where they all come from. I couldn't tell you exactly where this one came from. It came from a vendor. It came from a vendor. You were fucking yanking my chain. Um, get close. Did not being so fucking polite. So, get the answer. All right, you run this place. It ain't where we were. You seem, you seem like an honest gentleman, but you're still in charge. So, you're my best chance of getting out of here. You keep jerking me around like this, and I swear to God, I swear to God, I will pry the answers out of your fucking skull. And as you say that, that tremor that Dr. Glass was feeling starts to be felt by everybody. The room shakes, the glasses shake, that blot in the sun starts to grow just a bit. And Dr. Glass, you feel your connection. You feel it's stronger now. And that blot in the sun tremors just as the rest of the world does around you. All right, I, I want to give I want to give you the answers you want. I, what would you like me to say, sir? Nihilus goes to quickly grab the copy of the testimony in Veritas, ignoring everyone else while doing that. Esper gently took the dagger and traded the fork with Doctor Glass, but as she did, she took the pummel side and motioned towards her head for a moment and then put her eyes back on Usher and Trevor. I'm going to vault over the desk, pushing him uh, back as I do so, and just with my forearm uh, against his chest, the other one up against his lapel, just going to go, how do we get out? If you give me the answers, I won't have to take them. You feel as his body slams into the wall behind him, your forearm pinning him there, and just as that slam happens, so does the entire world earthquake. Things fall off the shelves, books fall off the shelf, the structure of the hotel waning in the tremors. As this he struck, everything shakes. I don't know, man. I don't know. I I told you everything I know. We're at Fort Hillcrest. We're on the island of Crow Perch. He's going to punch the wall right beside his head. <laughs> Not good enough! And he is going to... Ripping him by the lapels again, turn 180 degrees, and he's going to throw him across the desk. You throw him across the desk as he strikes the wall this time. You see his head snap back and hit one of the shelves hard very hard and things start to fall apart the bookshelves are falling down the ceiling tiles are falling from the ceiling light fixtures falling onto the ground the floor starting to crackle and break beneath you as everything shakes and you all fall through the floor not hitting the floor below farther and farther and deeper and deeper until you're jolted awake. You're sitting at the table in the old room. You see this beast 
what mouth it has is engulfing Maggie's head. You see she's limp, her arms at her sides. She's no more. And this beast, for the moment, doesn't notice as you wake up. Everybody, please roll initiative. And also, let's take a break there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I have so many questions. <laughs> okay. Everybody good? Uh, also, what were everybody's initiative rolls? 13. 10. I'm going to write it on, next to his name on my list. Uh, 20. And Dr. Glass, you are muted. Sorry, 15. Oh, boy. I have to figure out what I'm going to do. Okay, just so you know, the turn order will be Trevor, followed by our lovely friend, then Dr. Zadora Glass, Nihilus, and Esper, in that order. Okie dokie. Trevor, you start to come to, your eyes feel heavy, and as you peel away the crust, opening them... Your vision's a bit blurry, and at the center of the table, there's a beast. It's very large. Its snake-like body, its clawed arms, legs, whichever's which, it's hard to tell. A single red eye in the center of its, what you presume to be its face, because the only other feature there that's identified is the gaping maw that engulfs the head of Maggie Crane. You see your allies, too, beginning to come to, stirring from their rest, and it's your turn. This is a surprise round. What would you like to do? Oh, boy. Oh, so I get... Okay. Wonderful. Uh, Trevor, as he begins to wake up, he's kind of like hunched over the table by probably the viscous noises uh, right nearby causes him to jolt up as he sees the rest of his friends and Maggie halfway inside the orifice of this thing. I hesitate to call it a mouth. And when he immediately gives a bit of a start, a backup, before he immediately flips from scared to adrenaline rush, need to protect people, full on bodyguard mode. Uh, get off her! Uh, he is instantly going to use the, uh, the seat that he was on as a stepping stone to lift himself up onto the table here. Uh, he's going to turn. And as he is going to step up onto the table, he actually uses it uh, as like a platform to leap. Uh, and he goes uh, a good distance up into the air before he begins to kind of rotate 360 degrees. His foot now way up in the air and when he comes down, he is going to slam the creature down. Uh, I imagine at this point, uh, you know, you might have said Maggie is no more, but uh, unfortunately, Trevor didn't hear the narrator. So he's going to uh, try and separate uh, Maggie from the creature uh, by attacking where it appears that she's attached with just this big smashing axe kick uh, as he brings his heel down on the creature. Roll to hit. Yeah, all right. Let's see the, how we go. Well, uh, that's a good sign of things to come with a nat one. You go to bring your heel down on this creature and as if it has some otherworldly insight, you see it's skin and scales 
start to shimmer in this wave pattern towards the spot that you're about to hit it. And it dodges its nimble body, slithering to the side out of the way, if, as if by intuition. You slam down onto the table as Maggie's body is thrashed to the side, still in its maw, but thrown around like a rag doll. I'm not getting away that easy. Uh, he's going to take a deep breath, kind of wincing with the pain, uh, kind of square up to the creature in a classical kind of boxing stance, and is just going to do a quick one-two combination as he's going to use Flurry of Blows, uh, spend a key point, uh, and make a couple more attacks. Uh, first one, oh my god, is a seven. Second one, please, come on. It's a 12. You go with the first flurry of blows. You strike it with your fists, its scales deflecting. They're, they're so rigid and tough. It's astonishing how it can move with such grace slithering its body. And with the second one, you punch at the same spot, dislodging some of that outer armor, but you know that you've got no purchase in this moment. Fuck. I don't know what things I need to hit. Uh, everybody! Uh, and he's just gonna kind of like, still squaring up. And, well, that's, that's gonna be his turn. You see as this creature, it's still gnawing on the body of Maggie. It looks completely focused and intent on that task before it diverts any attention to the minor nuisances around it. Dr. Isadora Glass, you start to rouse as you see Trevor smash at the table and start pummeling this creature. You're awake. What would you like to do? She's going to speak into its mind as the verbal components and say, Well, dear, I see why you scuttle around ducks, but if you and I work on your confidence, perhaps you could own it? And she casts Vicious Mockery. Which it's is a wisdom, a save. wisdom save DC 13. <laughs> what you hear is thousands of voices all screaming at the same time. However, with a wisdom save of a 17, it's as if your voice can't pierce through that crowd. Mm. I was hoping to find out how it reacts to psychic damage, but uh, alas. Uh, and that's my turn. Nihilus. <sighs> What? Oh, like, be my, we must get rid of it. Uh, fight! Yeah, he puts down his his spell book onto the table. He flips it open in a quick page. All the fighting, all the rousing going next to it. Uh, he grasps his uh, claw, his hand quite firmly, and suddenly the, this arcanic divinity word just starts to spark in lightning as he reaches out with his fist and he just tries to punch in the demon and he casts Shocking Grasp on it for a total of uh, for a total of il, total of ten. Oh boy. You strike this creature and that, that electrical energy, the, the magic energy shatters in all directions. It strikes the ceiling and the walls as they start to crumble around. Portraits fall, glasses fall, but yet still not enough to pierce the hide of this creature. Source, protect me. I must focus. And he grabs his spell book, his Testimonium Veritas, and he clasps it into his shield onto his arm as like a, a nice spell book. just jams it in there, and he stands ready. Ends his turn. Esper. Esper comes to and her, her eyes shoot forward and and it's almost like in frozen time she feels the air of the creature moving next to her and she slowly turns her head and she's staring up at it she, no 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 and she's backing up she stumbles out of her chair and she does not take a turn okay you see this creature start gnawing at the body until it comes completely loose. The head, the shoulders, completely gone as the torso falls to the ground. Guts pour down the table over the plates and glasses and off the edge, dripping with a meaty sound to the floor. Trevor, 
this creature now looks at you, it's one red beady eye in your direction, and it's done with its meal and ready to address the smaller nuisance. What would you like to do? That's right. As on me. Uh, he's just going to uh, go and basically now he's just trying to aim. He sees that eye now focus on him. Seems like a good a target as any. He's just going to dive in, just big old straight punch down the middle. Uh, hopefully this round is a little better for everybody. <laughs> Holy shit. Holy shit. Eleven. You strike again at its hide. Its scales all shudder as they come to, to rouse in the direction of your punch, almost to protect itself. And it's not enough. One of these has got a hit. Uh... He's going to spend another key point and do another flurry. Uh, come on, man. Y you gotta work with me here, Trevor, you and me. Okay, 19. You strike it. What does it look like? Uh, as he does this, like, his hand almost gets caught uh, in the squishy uh, skin the first time. Uh, he basically uses his big booted foot to brace himself to pull his uh, hand out. In doing so, he kind of takes a couple steps back and just leaps forward and does basically a big uh, jumping karate kick and just sinks his big jack boots uh, right in the flesh. Uh, you see as the scales start to wave in that direction in a similar way that it does to protect itself, but they don't get there fast enough. You strike and it's kicks the scale straight through, putting a divot into this creature, and you see black ichor pouring out of the crevices between its scales. It screeches. Ah! More where that came from, ugly. Are you doing anything else? Oh, well, first, I'll tell you what damage I do. Uh, that's seven points of bludgeoning damage. Uh, and with my open hand technique, since that was with my flurry of blows, uh, it needs to make... Uh, Actually, it doesn't need to make a save for this. Uh, it cannot use reactions until the end of my next turn. Very interesting. I uh -huh. see it dazed there. And I get one more attack. Uh, so let's see if this works. Uh, oh, that was almost a five, but I'll take the 23 instead. That's a hit. It's just one more basically spinning back fist... Uh, coming off of the momentum of that jump kick. Oh, max damage again for another seven damage. There we go. Now it's all coming back. You strike it again, this time compounding on the same spot, pushing that scale further in until meat is starting to become visible. This meat doesn't look like that of a cohesive creature. It's like an amalgam of various different types of flesh that starts to ooze out from around the scales. <laughs> is that the end of your turn? Yeah, with with his uh, open hand technique, he's able to find the pressure points and get him to stagger slightly, or whatever this creature is, um, and just get it to kind of shudder. Uh, and he's going to take uh, a leap off of the table, uh, knowing that, having done this before, knowing the right pressure points to cause something to... Uh, Stun for at least a moment. He's going to call out, You need to get away, now's the time. And he's just going to keep squaring up, and that'll be his turn. You see as its single red eye is transfixed on you. It's almost mesmerizing, hypnotizing. You see your reflection in it, looking back at you, almost judging you, casting judgment on you. You can't tell. And... Please roll an intelligence saving throw. It's not a good idea. Uh, so I believe that's a negative one. <laughs> oh my God. And that one, <laughs> minus two. Let's see what happens. Trevor, it's mocking you. He's looking at you and judging you for your past actions. And you start to hear your voice in your own head coming from the reflection in its eye. You just let them die. You let them all die, and now you're alone because of it. And 
everybody else sees as Trevor is transfixed, motionless. You take 12 points of psychic damage, and you see as the creature's scales, just as this happened, you can tell it's related, start to regrow in the damaged spaces. Trevor, are you all right? What happened? Did you say to me? You have a negative one modifier to your intelligence. Or you have a basically minus one to your to your uh, intelligence, yeah. Oh. Minus two. <laughs> On a good day. Dr. Glass. Oh, all right. Well, none of that was great except for the part about no reactions. So she's going to clock it with her cane. Go ahead and roll the hit. Okay. 22 to hit. That's a decisive hit. You strike it with the cane. Uh, eight bludgeoning damage, and then psychic blades, which is my last bardic, is seven psychic damage. The cane strikes, and you know this cane well by now. You've had it for a bit, and as it strikes, you deal decisive damage, that eight damage. However, you can tell that the psychic reverberations of the cane seem to get absorbed by its body, its scales, that vibration shimmers through its scales through it, almost protecting it. I had a feeling, but I had to try. And uh, then she is going to back away from the creature her full speed. You begin to back away and you see it tries to turn in your direction. It thrashes its body. It goes to thrash one of its limbs at you. But it seems stuck. Unable to move. And reminder that I only my speed is 25 feet, not 30. Nihilus. Hmm. Uh, Nihilus uh, disappointed himself that he couldn't get out of it. He, uh, he takes the wisdom of Trevor and he sees how Dr. Class is able to move away and he does exactly that as well. He takes his distance and he moves away, still keeping an eye on his enemy as he, as he will cast a witch bolt turned into a force bolt for a total of for a total of 16 if that hits it does as it does which this this ability that is normally just a link between the target and themselves that is of an electric current is suddenly he knows it's of such a thick skin he needs to pierce it and that's why this forceful ability in this red aura just ignites through its thick hide for a total of nine force damage on it and he's now concentrating on this link to keep repeating this damage at a turn you see it shudders its entire body. Several more of its scales start to fall to the ground with a clanging sound off of the table and onto the floor. Are you doing anything else? Be gone, demon. I revoked you from this plane. He ends his turn. Esper. In Esper's world, things are muffled and strange, and it's almost as if she's not quite believing that she's there, as if she's still in that vision. But it is the moment that somewhere on the other side she hears Trevor's voice and it sounds distressed and it sounds like he might be hurt that Esper's eyes fly to the table is there anything on it? Anything on... The table. There's table settings plates, forks, knives again these are just table knives, butter knives at that, glasses The butter knife is going to have to do She's saying she's frozen for a moment, then her hand is reaching over. No, no, she's going to grab the butter knife, and she's immediately going to rush to jab it as hard as she can, trying to get into this creature's side. Roll to hit with an improvised weapon. Uh, now what does an improvised weapon... I think it's still strength that just doesn't use your proficiency. Okay. That's a five. You strike its hide with this knife... You look down, and the knife is bent. Get away from him! She's gonna square up. She has to stand on the chair. She's gonna climb her back on it. Try and make herself big. And she will end her turn. Trevor, you were transfixed on this eye, but you can feel its grasp over you waning. You're conscious. You can take an action. You can take your turn. 
okay? Uh, well, this will be fairly simple then. Uh, he is just going to, like, those who can get a good look at Trevor can see he is more upset than probably even the doctor has ever seen him. He's, like, gripping onto the sides of his head, uh, hearing the voices echoing, hearing his own voice. Uh, you can see there's blood starting to gush out of his nose and out of his ears from the psychic attack. You see, he just goes, wipes his face, looks at his bloody palm, and then just grips it into a fist. What the fuck did you say? And is just going to leap, uh, basically clearing the table, uh, and is just going to... Now, you see, before, it was the, uh, the exemplar of grace. Now he is ripping and tearing into this thing. Uh, just clubbing blows overhand. It, nothing graceful at all. Uh, let me see if this hits, first and foremost. Uh, 15? That hits. Hmm. As he does that, uh, he deals... Oh, I keep rolling fours. Another seven bludgeoning. Uh, as the... Basically, the, the blood keeps flowing down his face, uh, soaking into the uh, tank top that he's wearing, just staining it. Uh, yeah, let's use all my key points. Why not? It's not like we need them. Uh, he's going to go for one last flurry of blows and make two more attacks. I think that's what he would certainly do. Uh, that's not going to hit, and that's certainly not going to hit. So from the first hit, he's just clubbing, and then the next one is literally him just trying to grab on. Like, he's not in his right mind currently, and he is losing himself to his rage, pretty much. And is just... just beside this thing, trying to dig his way into it. But that you is just his you're... turn. Oh, you see as your punch starts wrecking through its outer hide, its scales now starting to fall apart, the inner portions of its body now becoming visible as you see this black, scaly inner hide. You also see some translucent spots on its skin, casting light into the inner workings of its body, and there you see bones and meat of all kinds. Human, orc, elf all mixed together comprising of the entire structure of this being and as this happens it looks at everybody's aghast faces and it's going to strike for the first time for the first time esper and trevor be careful esper a 19 to hit that hits trevor a 15 to hit that hits Trevor, take 9 points of damage, Esper, take 13, and be pushed back 10 feet as it strikes you with two of its limbs simultaneously, smashing you across the room, hitting you into the walls on either side, things falling off of the old dusty shelves, dust kicking into the air, as it then, with its bonus action, looks towards Nihilus, and its single red eye transfixed on you. Nihilus, please make an intelligence saving throw. Oh god. Oh god. Focus on the brainy ones. For a total of... For a total of 14. Nihilus, you see yourself in his eye reflected back at you. You see as he takes out his magnifying glass and he points it in your direction, looking. And... Is that me? Is that me? You left the testimonium, came here, left your family, your friends. I would never. I, I had to. And please take 12 points of psychic damage. Uh. <laughs> you see as its scales, what remain of them, start to point outward and start to shimmer like that of a cicada all of them simultaneously as it is starting something. Dr. Glass, it's your turn. 
all I have left is psychic damage or getting right up in there. And she is going to clutch her pocket watch and she's going to use her last spell slot and really, really hope that uh, this creature does not do well on the wisdom save this time and cast Dissonant Whispers. She is going to whisper out loud and in the creature's mind, you had your chance to talk, now back off. And it's a DC 13 wisdom save. If it loses, it takes damage and has to move away. And it still takes damage if it fails. That is a natural one. (laughs) You start screaming in to the void of its thoughts with these dissonant whispers and the cacophony of yelling noise coming from all of the minds transfixed through this creature starts to quiet as you find its own voice. You find the subtle scream of this creature in the background, latch onto it, and succeed. So that's 12 psychic damage. Hopefully just hopefully it's just resistant and not, not uh, immune. And it must immediately use its reaction, which it has back now, I believe, uh, to move as far as its speed allows away from me. Will he encroach an opportunity attack range? Because it uses its own reaction, it is uh, voluntarily moving. So it would trigger opportunity of attacks. Right. Mm. Please take an opportunity attack, Esper. Yeah. All right. I am butter knifeless. Let's go. Just punch him. She's going to reach out as it sh- rushes by and almost as if on instinct, just reaches out and punches towards it with a 20. Oh, let's That's go. That's a hit. I'd like to think, uh, I think that Isadora's whisper self was like, use your magic. I believe it just does an automatic five. Uh, yeah, I think it just does your strength modifier and damage. Yep. You deal five points of damage, striking it as it runs by. Now you're starting to hit the inner workings of this creature, bruising its interior. She's just looking at it while her her knuckles are shaking a little bit. It's like, it's like the light is starting to come into her eyes and she's switching on now. Nihilus. Nihilus, seeing the, the rapid course of action happening all over the place, he looks towards Trevor with a bonus action. He says, I need you. We need you. Your wounds, let me take care of them. And he will cast Cure Wounds as a bonus action to heal for... You mean healing word? Uh, just... Oh, yeah, sorry. Healing word for just a small uh, three healing po- hit points. And as he looks at Trevor, strain the eye with his other hand that he has used to cast spells previously, he he holds it out towards the beast, still looking at Trevor like with a, with a hope of conviction. This force red aura that was previously shot at the creature, he's still in a link connection to it. It had gone transparent from a, a bright red to a mere gray transparent object. But he clutches his fists with a red aura around his own fist, and suddenly the object inside of the creature starts to activate again. And with his action, he just pulls it, and the object starts to go rampant in the innards of the beast. And it starts to immediately, without any save or or any save or chance of dodging from it, it automatically takes another three force damage. It takes three more force damage. And at this point, you see the inner workings of this creature completely starting to open up. One might say it looks bloodied. As he does, Nihilus is in a confident position right now, but he is severely wounded as he starts a coughing of blood as it looks like his mind has been attacked itself and he tries to get behind cover in the room next by if he can with his movement. Certainly can. Are you doing anything else? He ends his turn afterwards. Esper. Did my being propelled back against this wall drop anything for me that I could use as an improvised weapon. Falling from the wall, sev- several typical objects that might be in a hotel, but you see a wonderful bust of a uh, human guy leaning against a tree. Looks solid, made of metal. Would you allow me a free action to pick it up? Absolutely. Wonderful. 
because as she's looking at it and she reaches down, she turns her head back towards this creature as it's moving away from her. He said no. No! And she's going to rush him as her face, which has seemed so afraid this entire time, ever since they came to this floor, suddenly it's not wild with fear, but her jaw is set so hard that it quivers slightly, and her lips are tensed and tight as she catapults herself towards this, and she is using her bonus action to choose to fight. Uh, in mechanical terms, she is raging. And she is going to try and aim her best at this thing in one of these open spots that Trevor has so graciously opened for them. She's going to try and bash that thing into it. I say 21. That will hit. What would you say the damage would be? Bludgeoning. I believe, I think, for base it's 1d4. An object that bears no resemblance to a weapon deals 1d4 damage. Uh, the GM assigns a damage type appropriate to the object. Oh, yeah. Uh, straight 1d4, yep. No modifiers attached. N no, it's just uh, the 1d4. No. All right. She is going to run up, and she is going to, from the side, hurl this thing into it from the side and deal one damage. It strikes the creature, and you can almost, you can almost picture a grin on its maw if it even had those muscles. But somehow its red eye gives you the impression that it is not impressed. Quick correction, though. Oh, no. Well, yeah, it is with a melee weapon, technically, because it's improvised. It's going to turn into a three because I'm raging. Ah, yes. Let's go. There you go. So three damage. Same reaction, though. And she's going to just snarl back at it. You're not getting out of here. You see as the scales move quicker and quicker and begin to buzz, you can hear it reverberating and all of the ceramic and glassware around the room starts to shake along with it. Something's about to happen, Trevor, it's your turn. Well, when you say something's about to happen, that gives me pause, but also Trevor is not in a good mind space. So, you see... Actually, I don't know if we decided this, because since Esper doesn't have a weapon, but being a bodyguard, would uh, Trevor have his have a weapon that he would be allowed to bring into the city? I would say yes. Uh, when you say a weapon that you'd be allowed to bring into the city, does something come to mind? Uh, I have equipped on him a short sword. The city isn't locked down in any way. You could have your weapon. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then in that case, he uh, reaches uh, into a sheath that he has strapped to his thigh. And you see him just take out a short sword. And with a step much heavier than he was when he was uh, sneaking, you just hear... As he is just going to start charging. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. Uh, into the room... Short sword, still drawn. Just fucking head. Just shut up and bleed! And is just going to try and jab it in. Uh, please, come on. You gotta work with me here. There we go. 24. That's a hit. Uh, that is going to be just five points of piercing damage. You strike it into its body... And as you do so, the black viscera and blood, along with some red, scatters out into the room. It sprays the wall to the side, staining it with that red stain, with a red mist that starts to protrude. The red mist starts to engulf the room and get deeper in the same way it did last time. Everybody, please roll wisdom saving throws with disadvantage. Oh, not this again. I don't want to hurl. Oh, there was a 20 on one side. That is a two. Four. Nine. Eleven. Trevor, your blade sticks into this creature, and you start to feel your 
consciousness go in and out. You dip your head, you know what's happening, you try to fight it. Everybody is well, you try to fight it to stay awake. But, Trevor, you, you open your eyes and you're crowded by a group of people. You're on the floor looking up at the ceiling and you notice something interesting. The edges of the ceiling, where the plaster drywall meet the corners of the room, are a bit molded. The chandelier has some dust on it. And as you look around to everybody around you, you see Harland Usher standing in the corner, getting his head bandaged, holding it. You see the entire the cast of Midnight Whispers, at least those you've met, the director, they're helping him and the rest of the group, you're sitting in the corner in some chairs. You hear Harlan's voice. It's okay, it's okay. They, I'm sure it was a mistake. They probably mistook me for somebody. What's the meaning of this? The director, Adrian, looks at you, Trevor. Why would you do such a thing. Our host, no less. Trevor, uh, now coming to, just instinctively, he's going to reach uh, up to his nose and look. Is he still bleeding? Yes. This place. He starts looking around, seeing that it's different in another way. But he just kind of says, brought me back before this is some place new again <laughs> you're gonna let me out I need more he's just slowly gonna get up from his chair this time a lot slower he's in a lot of pain get out of my way they're there the director walks over and puts his hand on your chest gently carefully and brings up a glass of water. It's okay. Just breathe. You're okay. You have five seconds to explain where I am and what is going on. That's what he did last time. He kept asking me, where am I? What's going on? Sir, the director, Adrian, you're among good people. Kind caring people who don't want to see any harm. Time's up. My hand doesn't go for the lapels, it goes for his throat. Roll an athletics check. 21. You grab his throat. <coughs> Sir! Stop that! <coughs> and... The people in the room start to crowd around. You see Eliza, Gregory, Adrian, Constantine, and several others that just seem to be different patrons of the hotel, all swarming to try to rip you away from this man. Roll athletics again. All right, that, that makes sense. Uh, 17? You hear Adrian. I can't breathe! And Constantine, I'm trying to pull him, but he's too strong. As this is happening, I try and break from them trying to grab at me. I want to flip him around and hold him in a chokehold. Other hand behind him, I'll go. Nobody moves forward. Nobody takes one fucking step or I'll break his goddamn neck. in a traditional chokehold now. And as this happens, the room comes to a standstill. Everybody takes a step back. And Constantine, the half-orc, pulls out a very crude-looking barrel and trigger. You'd almost mistake this for a gun. In fact, it probably is, if not an incredibly incredibly early contraption of one and he points it 
You hurt him. I hurt you. Put him down. Pointing his body towards the barrel. And are you doing anything else before he pulls the trigger? I mean, that's what he'll say. If he takes a shot, that's fine. I think Dr. Glass might speak up at this point. She's making eye contact with Trevor, but she says, If I might intervene, gentlemen, I am a doctor of the mind. Perhaps Trevor would let me speak to him. Is he holding Harlan or Adrian? I'm confused. He's holding uh, Adrian. Perfect. I could perhaps mediate with both men in private if they'd allow it. Speak up now, you ain't got much time. I don't want to pull this trigger. Just let the man go. You see him sweating. Or if you, Constantine, is it? If you would would sit in on the mediations to make sure everything's above board, that is fine by me. Yes! Mediate! Just let go of this man's throat! You hear Eliza from the background. Please! Please, not Adrian! I start Trevor, to dart, let's to all dart. sit down. What happens if I let him go? You gonna take the shot? No. I just don't want to see you kill a man. I don't want to kill a man today. He'll let go. Kick him forward. (laughs) Constantine speaks up. What's come over you? Just letting everybody know where we stand. You're the big man in the room now. It's clear where we stand. Adrian, get out of here. I'll let go. And the two of them start to scurry out, as well as, uh, as well as, uh, Eliza, Gregory, until it's just Constantine left behind. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, I would like a word with you later to make sure you're all right. <clears throat> yes, of course. And quietly she says to Trevor, We can't kill these people, Trevor, they're already dead but I'm fairly certain they can kill us. And I got a clean conscience. Nihilus raises his head from the table a bit slower than the others. Perhaps he's not the the toughest. He stands up in a a weak grip and he says out loud, the the hell spawn, the abomination. It, It must have been confident in its ability since we were under... Whatever it is you call this for so long, surely we must repeat the same actions we did prior, your actions, Trevor, to get rid of this spell. We must make haste. Where is this Harland? We could repeat the same actions and expect different results. That has, uh... Worked last time. There's a word for that in my field. But perhaps we could try to figure out what's going on with the ghosts. Could I please make a check to survey the room? Certainly. I can tell you on a baseline, you see Harland Usher's office exactly as I described it earlier. Are you looking for something in particular? As a player, yes, but I want to make a check to see if Esper notices it. The globe with the black spot. The the sun outside of the window. Oh, it's straight up the sun. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Glass, you noticed this as well. That black spot is still there. You almost feel a connection to it. It feels familiar to you, but perhaps at first you can't place why. And as this happens, Const- and Esper, you would notice, Constantine speaks up. Listen. I don't know what it is you're going through, but... Hurting the people here is not going to make things better for anyone. So, I'm not saying you're off scot-free. I'm going to keep my eye on you. But, look, Crow Perch is a volatile place right now. There's prospectors looking for wealth. There's bandits looking for wealth. And there's dangers... Numerous. So, I understand if things have went awry somewhere. And I'll put in a good word with Harland. Adrian might not want to look at you. 
I'll leave you some time. But please. You seem like you've been keeping an eye on them. Is Adrian volatile, much like Crow Perch itself? Adrian makes bad decisions sometimes. That's all I'll say. Maybe drinks a bit too much, but... You're asking if he's about to kill a man the way this man did today. No. Well, that's funny be- that you would say that because I was not about to ask that. Uh, thank you for filling in that gap. I was about to ask if you uh, noticed if he'd purchased anything odd or brought in any strange artifacts or done anything unusual quite recently. You see Constantine give you a very suspicious look. His eyebrow raises. He looks at you sternly for a moment, waiting to hear you finish the sentence. He's almost jarred a bit by your words. You can tell this without an insight check. No, Adrian's brought nothing, to my knowledge. No unusual outside influences at all? No visits to the mysterious sectors of Crow Perch Markets? He walks towards you. Right. What are you on about? What have you seen? And she asks this genuinely, because she's a little surprised by this reaction. Are my questions incendiary, Mr. Constantine? If you must know, I am worried that something is amiss, and I took you for a man invested in the group's safety. Perhaps I was wrong. He pauses for a very noticeable five seconds, looking at you and thinking, until finally, I don't know what you're on about, but perhaps bandage this man up and enjoy your time like the rest of us here at the Whaler Hotel. So Detect Thoughts would still be up, but I know that doesn't really work. Uh, Can I insight check him, even though I have disadvantage, just to see... I mean, he doesn't know me, that's not a crazy reaction, but he was the person sleeping in the room where I found that knife, and I just... Which kind of shift... Can I tell which kind of shifty is he being? Is he a bad actor? Not as in a, 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 chewer, a, a scenery chewer, but a malfeasance. Inside. Disadvantage. Uh, 15. I have expertise. During that five second stare, as he decides his actions, you too get a good look back at him. And you notice something. His sleeves always rolled down to his wrists as he crosses his arms in front of you, reveal some scratches along his wrists. They're black, almost pestilent if they didn't look like they were healing. They look just like the scratches you remember seeing on Trevor and Esper when they were struck by this creature and flung against the wall. And as you notice this, as your eyes look down, he almost instinctively pulls at his sleeves and puts his arms back to the side. Mm. So he's patient zero. She does not say aloud. Uh, I'm done here. Yes, you are. Thank you. Constantine. Yeah. You mind just... I'm sorry. I'm... I took a hit to the head, as you can see. He kind of wipes his nose a little more. I took a bit of a bump. I just, if you don't mind Satan, my curiosity, how did we get in here? Like, physical like. Like, we came into this room. We came into that dining area. How'd we do that? I mean, look, I, I get it, you You got a bout of confusion. Uh, You probably checked in like the rest of us. And he looks over towards the corner where you see Maggie sitting and staring off at the bookshelves across. She's so small in that corner, she could almost be unnoticed. Why don't you talk, talk with those who you got here with? Maybe they can help. You didn't answer my question. It weren't how I checked in, it were how I walked in this room. Look, 
You walked in like the rest of us, I can only imagine. You can only I've... imagine, but you didn't see. I don't know, man. There's a pause and a look out of the window as he looks out upon the sky of Crow Perch, the citadel, its spire, visible in the distance. The weather is stunning today. He looks back. How did you enter this room? Does it matter? We're here, in this beautiful hotel, and it's nice. It's real nice. No, no it ain't. Yeah. He turns, he walks towards the door, and he opens it, and he looks back at you. Nice enough. He steps out and closes the door. And that's where we'll end today's session. <laughs>